You are always good. You are only good. You are always good to me. Though my eyes can see, help my heart believe. You are always only good. This won't be for everyone, but it'll be for some of you. Try and picture uh, yourself sitting in a in the gym with about a thousand people on a nice hot summer night. <laughs> you know, a nice hot summer night, and hearing hearing all these teenagers sing a song. Let's sing verse three together. Looking up, looking up, I can see your sympathy. I doubt myself, but I'm sure of your love. Lavish grace was poured out at Calvary, securing me for our home above. You are always good, you are only good, you are always good to me. Though my eyes can see, help my heart believe, you are always on Good. Steve, I forgot you was running the van route. Everybody home? Good. It was nice to pick up four, four or five kids today. And uh, believe it or not, uh, Haley was home this morning. She's been working on weekends, but um, she's home this morning. Tell you she wasn't ready. maybe get her to come back be with us you girls can work on her on that <clears throat> Haley was actually to her great responsibility was actually in care caretaker for the weekends for a, an elderly lady over towards Union but she passed away so that was the, that was the work that Haley was doing Hebrews chapter 12 Sometimes messages are, are definitely connected Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon. I think you see that often. Lord will, and next Sunday morning we'll try and use the projector some and give some visual uh, pictures of parts of the um, parts of the message. Just as surely as there's some big John 3.16 passages, not John 3.16, there's other 3.16 verses that are really big that, that seem just connected. Um, chapter 12, verse 1 seems to be some big verses. Let me give you a couple, see if even just me starting them, you, you can finish them. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, Remember now thy Creator, in the days of thy youth. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. 12, 1, 12, 1, if that helps you remember. Here we are at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We'll read verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, Seeing we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 2 about Jesus is directly connected to Isaiah 53, who for the joy that was set before him. So the Lord endured Calvary looking ahead. Verse number 1, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, some commentaries of great people, theologians say, that Hebrews chapter 11 are people who were testimonies of their faith. And so we have that testimony. Others, including myself, believe that they are witnesses to our life. 
that there is some knowledge in heaven about what we're doing. Chapter 11, verse 40 said, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Their race isn't complete without those who run the race in verse 1 of chapter 12. And knowing that the Lord gave three examples of lost things found. And on each occasion, he said, the thing that was found brought rejoicing in heaven or the Father's house. If they didn't have any knowledge of what was going on, on earth, how would they rejoice that someone lost was found? So I could at least, if I'm going to be 51%, 49% on the other, it's more than just they were testimonies of the faith. But they handed off the baton and, await, and now are witnesses of those that are here. And how, how all that goes about in the, in the days and things to come, I say this. In this passage, he says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In our first service, it talked until, until the end, until the Lord's return, let us pray and pray without ceasing. I didn't even read 1 Thessalonians 5.17 where Paul just in a little statement said, pray without ceasing. In a constant state of prayer, I know we don't want to drive our car with our eyes closed and our heads bowed. That's the time where we want to watch and pray. I know we don't want to... You know, we don't want a surgeon to be closing his eyes while he's in surgery, but we wouldn't mind if he was in a state of prayer. Lord, help me with this. So pray without ceasing. Then in another passage in Peter, he said, pray always, or praying always. So praying always and praying till the end. Then I want to realize here this passage connected with this, since I had praying always, or praying without ceasing, run with patience. Look ahead. Jesus is the author and finisher, and he looked ahead to see the outcome of Calvary, and that was a joy to him. He endured the cross, despised the shame, knowing what it would produce. Keep that in mind. Dictionary. Are you going to use the new ones? The new collegiate dictionary is somewhat different. It talks more in modern terms without, any, without some of the original mean words. The 1828 Webster Dictionary, notice this frame. It's not just saying, you know, patience. Just, just being able to wait and not, have, and not lose your temper. New dictionary. Old dictionary. The suffering of affliction, pain, toil, calamity, or provocation with a calm temper. Like suffering something, but taking it calmly. Endurance without fretfulness and murmuring. I don't even know that the word murmuring is even used much anymore either. Endurance without fretfulness and murmuring. A calm temper which bears evil without discontent. That was B. C. The act or quality of waiting long for justice or expected good without discontent. I really like that one because it tied into the morning service. The act or quality of waiting long for justice. Or an expected good without discontent. By these definitions, I'm saying that patience, which is the root of the word long-suffering, or they're connected in their definition, it's more than just, you know, touching wet paint. I can't wait. Is it dry? <laughs> it's more than that. It's more than yelling at a slow driver. Come on! Already, uh, you know, I've got an example of it this week. You know what the definition is of a New York second? The amount of time it takes for the light to turn from red to green and the horn behind you to honk. Bing bong! You know, patience is more than, you know, yelling at or getting behind a school bus and wanting to just kind of rev it up a little bit, let them know you're... Patience is more than getting mad at the remote control. Come on. Like we push a button and we expect with modern technology, instant, right? Come on. Used to be phones. Ching, 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 ching. You know, come on. Like flipping it up and down 45 times real quick will make it work. Used to be radios. Oh, yeah, okay. 
those are just illustrations given could be more you know patience is the act or quality of waiting long for justice or expected good without discontent perseverance and bearing offense without anger or vengeance i do believe there's a, a good call for patience you know with with children with friends and people and so like that but in the scriptures Using the word patience and its derivative, long-suffering, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's an attribute of Christ. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. So let's use this real familiar passage and connect it with an example. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Hebrews, 1 Peter, 2 Peter... Hebrews, James, for Second Peter. Second Peter 3, verse 9. Romans 15, 5, I'll read it. Now the God of patience and consolation grant to you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, the God of patience. Second Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Second Peter, what promise? Chapter 3, verse 1. Last days, or verse 3. Last days scoffers shall come, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? The Lord's not loose on that. Slack. Like he's not, you know, he's not held to it. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise of his return. As some men count slackness. How we'd reckon it. But is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Beside verse 9, you should just go ahead and write verse 15. Because everything he says about the, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth, and we're waiting that day, etc. Look, verse 15, he repeats it. An account, reckon it this way. Why isn't the Lord returned? Where's, it, where's his promise on this? Account that the long suffering of our Lord is. Salvation, he's not willing any to perish. I've said before, he's still building a church. He's still waiting for someone to be saved. He is. But it's long-suffering. He is enduring, and he's putting up with, and he's, his patience is, he's, should I use the words, he's suffering defamation. People are ridiculing his name. People are calling him a liar. People are saying it isn't true. People are acting like it isn't so, living in sin like there is no, there's not going to be any recourse on this. The attribute of Christ concerning his promises for somebody else to be saved. Catch, put it this way. He's putting up with what he puts up with so somebody else still has benefits. Turn with me now to 1 Peter chapter 5. I said to be an example of this in the scriptures. And it's bigger than me giving a personal example. It really is. And I would not be the best for it, most likely. Anyways, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying. And if you say this, you're giving something that's true and accurate and folks can count on. That's the idea of being a faithful saying. It's something you can count on because of its veracity. Here we go. And worthy of all acceptation. If everyone said, okay, I believe that, it's worth of that. It's worthy of that. What is it? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Yay. Paul says, of whom I am chief. Paul was not an atheist. Paul, of anything in the Orthodox Pharisee it believes in, was a rigid believer in God. He was not an atheist. He believed God created heaven and earth. He believed as far as worshiping and serving God that every letter of the law should be kept. He was zealous. He was diligent. He was educated. He was a God believer. But as far as sinners are concerned, he was chief. How was he a chief of sinners? He hated Jesus. He says so. 
He blasphemed Jesus. He ridiculed Jesus. He went to people's homes, and if they believed in Jesus, he had authority from the temple police and from the Rome. Then a, the Roman government would just wash their hands and say, that's your own laws, you do what you want. So he had the authority of the Roman government. He could come and haul off your grandma and grandpa to jail if they said, We've, we believed in Jesus. He could make orphans out of children. He could take, take men could lose their job, you know, job and say, man, i got to do this and this and this and this to do to keep my job. Uh, do you get to still keep your job if you say, I believe in Jesus? There's going to come a day when the mark of the beast is going to come on the scene where you're going to swear allegiance. I say, where well, you're going to swear allegiance to the, the image of the beast, or you're going to say, no, I don't think so. It'll cost you a job then, or your life, if you get caught. caught. So if anybody said, We've, we're followers of, and he said, I made havoc of that way, the way of Jesus, the way of truth, you said, I believe in Jesus. Paul was after you. And he'd take you to jail or your family, cost you your life. He's the chief of sinners. He's opposing everything of Christ. Now watch, here's a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. Was Paul an enemy of the Lord? He sure was. But watch verse 16. How be it? For this cause I obtained mercy. How could the chief of sinners find mercy? Why? You know, and... That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. First of all, I could say the pattern of, of the Lord putting up with Saul. The Lord has to put up with this. Everyone who's saved and a believer is a member of the body of Christ. Here's... Here's an aged grandfather who's put his faith in Christ. And Paul takes that man, Saul takes that man and puts him in, in prison until he dies. And that man's suffering prison. The Lord, with a member of his body, suffers with that man. Why? Because he wants to make an example of Paul. What? That he can save him. And he'll wait a long time and put up with a lot to do it. Now, is that amazing? Do you realize how many people, with their just general unbelief, shake their fist at the face of God and, and not receiving Jesus? Do you know how many people we've witnessed to and say, ah, someday, I don't know. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, I don't know. So, this is a slight illustration, but I'll use it. If someone cooked you a really fine dinner and set a really nice table, and then open their house with a kind invitation for you to come. And they did it week after week after week after week. And week after week, you said, no, no. Why you quit? When are you going to quit asking me? Well, maybe next week. Maybe next year. Maybe in the spring. Maybe in the fall. Okay, next, next Sunday I'll come. No. How long would you keep fixing that dinner? Setting that table. And the Lord didn't just set a table. That's part of it. He gave his life. The cost of it. God gave his only begotten son. The cost of your redemption. Would you receive me? Not today. Next, next Sunday? Maybe next Sunday. No, not next Sunday. Next year, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, not today. How long should he wait? How long are you going to be that rude? How long are you going to be that defamation of the, of the character in Christ's sacrifice? You ever think about it? He said, the Lord is long-suffering. Paul said he saved the chiefest of sinners so you might know his long-suffering and his grace while they're connected. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. I think you've all probably seen this before. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 
Galatians 5. Do we still sing in, once in a while? Fruit of the Spirit is. I guess not. I can't even hardly remember it. Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Some of these are several in the same category, really close in definition. Meekness has to do with self-control. Temperance definitely has to do with restraint, but long-suffering is patience. I know when we're born again, the Holy Spirit has moved in and makes his residency. What? No, you're not. That your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. Thank the Lord. Uh, we've, given the, we've given the presence of the Lord some space, some real estate in our, in our being. Do we allow him to produce on that real estate? To garden. They're called the fruits of the Spirit. And you know, it's not going to be beans, brown beans, corn. It's going to be love. It's going to be joy. It's going to be long-suffering, meekness, and temperance. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to. And then in a neat word, can be used as a noun and a verb, such as the word um, presence. Present your body, bodies. Present your bodies. You know, you lift the word out, and it can be a present. It can be a noun or a present. It can be a verb. It can be an action. Isn't that something? And here's such another word that can have these dual, dual usages. Produce. What's produce? That's the stuff. The action of it is, is, the, is the work of it. The action of it, to produce something. The Holy Spirit. Have I yielded? the real estate for the Holy Spirit to produce in me long-suffering. What does that mean? You're going to have to put up with some things. You have to take, as we go back to the definitions, there's going to be times of, there's going to be times of discontent. There's going to be times of per, um, bearing offense. There's going to be times of uh, enduring provocation and doing it all with a calm temper. It's an attribute of Christ, if not a chief one, chief one of his grace. <clears throat> it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a testimony of the saints. And here is where, here's where the Bible just, again, grows in its depth. Turn with me to James chapter 1. How many times can you read through the Bible and read through a book? And say, I've read through that book 12 times. Uh, James is such a book that maybe through the year I'll read through four times, maybe six times. One of the main reasons, it's the theme of the book. Let me turn to it. James chapter 2, verse 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. That's the theme of the book. That's the theme of the book. Anybody says, I have faith, I have faith, and then their, their, their works, their, their manner of life and how they behave Folks will say back, I don't know about that faith. So if a man says, I have faith, then his works ought to match up and be a testimony to it. That's the theme of the book. Guess how the book begins and ends. Book ends of the book of James. James 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God, to the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Why are the twelve uh, tribes of Israel scattered abroad? Well, we go back to Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and a great persecution came upon the church, and they were scattered abroad. Persecution has set people fleeing from Jerusalem. I want to say to all you young people, I used the illustration in Sunday school from the Smithsonian Magazine, beginning of Sunday school. I, want, I just wanted to see, I wanted to show, show you what kids in other parts of the world have it like. They don't have basketball in the evening. They don't have cars around the Walmart. They don't have friends and phone, you know, like that. And I was showing the Smithsonian has a whole feature article of these kids, six, Seven, eight years old, up to 12, 12 years old, they can start working on it. But all these fishermen kids, they go to school early in the morning, they get off, and during, the, during this whole long fishing season, they work. 
And the fishermen take the body of the fish and then they discard in these piles of the heads like up to our steeple of the church. And these kids take their knives and these cold weather and they go out there and they cheek this, the fish heads. And they take the flesh, they tongue the cheek heads and they gill the cheek heads because these are things that can be made in the delicacy. And they work and they get pennies for all the fishing season in that brutal cold weather and drying racks are bigger than this church up on the mountainside covered with snow and ice and they they cheek those heads and they gill those heads and they tongue those heads and they hang all this stuff out to dry so at the end of two or three seasons little kids eight 19 year old can maybe buy a phone i use that by way of illustration I come around this, the testimony of the saints, their work ethic, their work ethic or their works ethic. James 1 verse 4, this tribes that are scattered abroad, they, they left Jerusalem, not because they're having a good time, said, I think we'll just want to be a missionary and go over to Cappadocia. I want to be a missionary and go down to Macedonia. They left because they lost their jobs and they're fleeing for their life and grandma and grandpa and dad and mom are in jail. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Diverse. Many. Varied. Knowing this, wait a minute. Got to look ahead now. Knowing this first, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. In a sense, I like the commentary, you know, it, it just like steel has to be tempered to be stronger, heated into the hot, hotter un, uh, ovens to be stronger, a tempered steel. We've gone over like you've gone over, most of you probably to Gatlinburg, you walk in the streets, and you go down, and you go to the candy shop, and there's the taffy machine. Woo! And that fascinating thing, it's pulling the taffy. That's how it gets its texture. They put the ingredients together, and it's basically this blob. They put it on the wheel, and the more they pull it, the stronger it gets to get its texture. Pulling taffy. So know this first. You're scattered because of our persecution. Don't think it's... Don't think it's anything unusual. Count it all joy. This is tempering you. You're to trying your faith. It works your patience. This is how, this is how it's tempered your long suffering. I continue, continue on with that thought. James 1, let's keep reading verse number 4. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting or like the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. You're lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom. <laughs> if any of you lack wisdom. I want to back up this. If any of you lack patience, let it be put to work. How? When everything's hunky-dory? Nope. When you're scattered. When you're in the great trials of afflictions. At that time, look ahead and see what is the good that's going to come out of this. Have patience. Endure it. Whether we like this or not, that's how the book begins. Turn with me to James chapter 5. Verse 11, I'm going to back up, but I want to read verse 11 and go in backwards order. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Have, uh, have we heard of the patience of Job? Yeah, that's why I referred to it this morning. How long did he wait in the dump heap, scraping himself with his illness and the memories of his lost family? At least seven days, at least. Why? Because his friends came with him and sat speechless seven days just looking at him. How long was that discourse between all them friends? I don't know. Maybe the next week. But he's in the... He's in that dire condition and suffered that much 
of loss. And we're said, do you remember the patience of Job? He waited for the Lord's answer. Watch this. The Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy. Now let's back up and see what this book in is. Verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren. This is the conclusion of the book. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. He put seed in the ground. You look at the package. By the way, I saw a lot of, I was in Lowe's last night, folks were buying seed. Is our folks getting ready for spring already? The folks in front of me had old packs of seed and stuff like that. Um, well, they put it in the ground. Do you sit out over there at night after you've put it in the ground and say, come on, come on. I mean, what? It's been, it's been 24 hours. Come on, come on. You look at the germination. Day. Oh, 55 days. Oh, 64 days. Some of that stuff, 90 days. We got a little small garden. So we found out to get the most out of it. I put the rows a lot closer than you ought to. That's fertilized every year. It's just a small garden. But also, I want, we want to double it, so I replant it every year. After the first picking, I pull the whole thing up and replant it again, so we get a double garden. But you know what I do? I, I look at the, how much time's left in the year after we get that first picking off the first one, you know, and I look at that package, and it says 55 days, and I look at the calendar, and I said, ooh, that's going to get me at September 4th or September 9th. I don't buy the stuff that says 85 to 90 days. Why? Ain't going to make it. I'm, I got to get that second harvest in, you know. Patience. You put it in the ground, you got to wait for it to come up. What he's talking about, the Lord hath, that, that the Lord, behold, the Lord cometh. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The bookends of, Job, uh, of James's letter is patience. Who would else would be a personal testimony of that? He said, you heard of the patience of Job. I wonder if James said, do you know my testimony? James was the half-brother of Jesus. The apostle James was slain by, by the sword by Herod, uh, King Herod. As the progression of time, so we know this difference, we know when we have a date when this book of James was written. We realize that his brethren didn't receive him. When it says he came into his own, it doesn't just mean the Jewish people. His mother and his brethren stood without and believed not on him. James is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. His half-brother is one who was a testimony of the resurrected Christ. And there's an early church record in Jerusalem that this was his half-brother. And he became, Galatians chapter 2 says, a pillar in the church. He became such a pillar in church when the first dispute came about the law being instituted to the Gentiles. They brought it back to the council in Jerusalem. And James, Jesus' brother, stood up. And said, then this is true. The Gentiles can be saved. And here's how we're going to handle it from here on out. Isn't it something? James can say, when, when my half-brother Jesus was on the earth, I was an unbeliever. But when he rose from the dead, I became a pillar. Isn't that fitting without being said specifically but being said principally that James could say hey to you saints that are scattered abroad wait Jesus is coming again be you patient long patient for the coming of the Lord be you also patient establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh I think this day and age until the end till Jesus comes again pray without ceasing When the Lord returns, we have found faith on earth. Pray and faint not. Number two, run with patience. You may have to put up with some stuff. But look to the end when Jesus returns. Amen.
Let's close with a word of prayer. Holy Lord, thank you for a good day to be in your house. Bless the church, we pray. May this be a great week. May some soul be saved. Bless the church as we look to the Lord's day next week in your will. Even so, come Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for coming Wednesday night, the last of Revelation 19.